Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born on the 21st of April, 1926. She was the first child of the then King's second son, the Duke of York. This was the young Princess Elizabeth at the age of four, visiting a photographic studio in London. Her life then was comparatively carefree. It was the abdication in 1936 of her uncle, King Edward VIII, that unexpectedly placed Elizabeth in direct line to the throne. Her father became king. Our king, the king. Our king, the king. His coronation gave the then 11-year-old Elizabeth a foretaste of what lay in store for her. The family unit was strong. Her father, George VI, was devoted to her and she to him. Throughout her life, he was to be her inspiration. During the Second World War, as German bombs fell on Britain, the royal family symbolized the country's fight against tyranny. Elizabeth briefly joined up. She was taught how to drive and to service an army lorry. On the night Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace and Elizabeth and her family on the palace balcony. By now she was a young woman and she'd fallen in love. Her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten was announced in July 1947. Four months later, they were married in Westminster Abbey. Again and again, the people called while Elizabeth and Philip. Again and again, they joyfully responded. A year later, their first child, Charles, was born. Two years after that, a daughter, Anne. The king had been in poor health. He'd been treated for lung cancer. When Elizabeth left for a visit to East Africa in February 1952, it was to be the last time she would see him. The flag is low as the news spreads. The king is dead. At the moment of her father's death from a heart attack, Elizabeth was in a game park in Kenya. The news that she was now queen was given to her by her husband. A tour of the Commonwealth Castle. The princess we knew as a girl and watched in the even growth of her stature comes back to meet her ministers as queen. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young, and so it was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. Britain was stunned at the loss of its wartime king. His coffin was brought by train from Sandringham to London. Elizabeth was there to receive it with her mother and sister. And now, here comes Her Majesty. Elizabeth's coronation in June 1953 was one of the biggest public celebrations in Britain's recent history. For the first time, television cameras were allowed into Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to millions moment of the Queen's crowning is come. As Elizabeth was crowned, she accepted what to her was a sacred duty, an obligation to serve, which was to set her apart for the remainder of her life. Elizabeth was sovereign and head of state, not just of the United Kingdom, but of Britain's realms and territories in every continent. Sydney siders turn out to greet their queen. In late 1953, she set off on the first of many overseas tours, with a six-month trip to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey to Australia. This is a joyous, fine, tingling welcome. The young queen was a star on the world stage, and her popularity was never greater. It's estimated that, in Australia, three quarters of the country's entire population turned out to see her in person. But as the 1950s gave way to the swinging 60s of the Beatles, attitudes started to change. Old certainties were questioned. The monarchy was seen by some to be stuffy and out of touch. By the late 60s, the palace realized that it needed to take the initiative. The result was a groundbreaking television documentary. The film Royal Family showed the monarchy as it had never been seen before. 
Elizabeth was shown performing the daily business of the sovereign. Yes, sir. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? And meeting visiting dignitaries. The American ambassador, your majesty. Oh, point it on the But the film also showed something of the private Elizabeth, relaxing with her family on a picnic at Balmoral. The salad is ready. A silver jubilee was spectated with street parties and pageants in 1977. You've had a very long, long day. By the 1980s, Britain had its first woman prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Relations between female head of state and female head of government were sometimes said to have been strained. With this ring, with this ring, I do well. I do well. For the Queen and her family, the 1980s had begun with a moment of great promise. Prince Charles's wedding in July 1981, the young lady Diana Spencer, seemed to be a moment of hope. When the marriage began to fail, its decline was a very public one. The couple's separation was announced in 1992. It followed the collapse of the marriage of Princess Anne and Prince Andrew. To compound the misery that year, the Queen had seen part of her favourite home, Windsor Castle, destroyed by fire. She was devastated. The fire seemed to symbolise the reversal of the royal family's fortunes. Little wonder that in a speech the Queen described 1992 as her annus horribilis, her horrible year. But worse was to follow. The death of the by now divorced Diana Princess of Wales in a car crash in Paris in August 1997 was to provoke what, for the Queen, was a shocking backlash against the monarchy. She remained at Balmoral with Princess William and Harry after Diana died. Her priority had been to care for her grandsons. But to the grieving crowds outside Buckingham Palace and elsewhere, it seemed as though the royal family simply didn't care. The Queen returned to Buckingham Palace and, in an unprecedented live broadcast on the eve of Diana's funeral, she tried to heal the breach that had opened between the palace and the people. What I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. The queen promised to learn the lessons from Diana's life and the reaction to her death. The whole episode had shaken her. For the first time, she appeared to be out of tune with the feelings of her people. With Charles's marriage to his long-term companion, Camilla Parker Bowles, in April 2005, the royal family was finally able to turn the page on the domestic anguish of previous decades. It was time to move on. For the Queen, it was a moment of relief. And in the years that followed, with scarcely any lessening of her workload, she appeared to enjoy her role with renewed enthusiasm. In 2011, she was at Westminster Abbey for the wedding of her grandson, Prince William, to Catherine Middleton. It was a moment when the public's appreciation for the monarchy seemed to be reconfirmed. A few weeks later, at the age of 85, the Queen made one of the most important foreign visits of her reign when she became the first British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland. She laid a wreath in memory of those Irish nationalists who'd risen up against the Crown and, at a state dinner in Dublin Castle, she spoke with regret about Britain's treatment of Ireland. With the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we would wish had been done differently, or not at all. The following year in Belfast, she met and shook hands with Martha Guinness, a former leader of the IRA who by then was Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. It was another significant gesture of reconciliation. Her diamond jubilee in 2012 confirmed the nation's regard for a monarch who reigned for 60 years. It was also the year when the Queen showed that she too could spring a surprise. Sovereign and secret agent one of the highlights of the opening night of the London Olympics. By the 
time of her 90th birthday in April 2016, she'd become the United Kingdom's longest reigning monarch, its oldest, and she would disagree, one of its most deeply respected. She continued with her public duties well into her 90s. There was further family turmoil, though. Prince Andrew was forced to withdraw from public life and it claims he'd sexually assaulted a 17-year-old, claims he denied. And then the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, decided that they wanted to step back from royal life. They moved to California and gave a television interview in which Meghan made damaging criticisms of the royal family. They were unsettling moments, presided over by a monarch who showed that her sense of commitment was undiminished. Together we are tackling this disease. During the coronavirus emergency of 2020, she broadcast a reassuring message to the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Her words seem to encapsulate her role as monarch, drawing on her own long experience to help settle the nation at a moment of difficulty. Her resilience was evident again in April 2021, when her beloved husband Philip died two months short of his 100th birthday. They'd been married for 73 years. At Philip's funeral at St George's Chapel within Windsor Castle, she seemed a solitary figure, pausing at one point to turn and look back. The figure who'd been two paces behind her for so many years was now absent. Elizabeth had lost the husband who'd meant so much to her. But despite the great sadness of her loss, there was never any question of her withdrawing from the path of duty. She marked the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne, a record no other monarch had achieved, in February 2022. By then it was apparent that she was rather more frail physically than before, though mentally as sharp as ever. Her doctors had advised her to take things a little easier. Light duties was the expression used by the palace, but every day there were red boxes full of official papers to deal with. In a message to mark her 70 years on the throne, she said she was humbled by the loyalty and affection she received throughout her reign, and she signed the statement, Your Servant, Elizabeth R. By June 2022, when the public celebration of her happened in Jubilee, her declining health limited the events she could attend. There was, however, a delightful surprise. A pre-recorded appearance, somewhat chaotic tea party, with Paddington Bear. Mm, perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always need one for emergencies. So do I. I keep it in here. Happy Jubilee, man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's very kind. This was a monarch at peace and enjoying herself. On the final day of the Jubilee celebrations, there was a final appearance on the balcony of Buckingham. The national anthem was sung, a much-loved monarch acknowledged the many thousands who waited to greet her. The crowds cheered and cheered, but finally it was time to go. The Queen turned to depart from the balcony on which she'd first been seen as a baby. There was an unspoken feeling that an era was drawing to a close. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth II embodied the strengths of a constitutional monarch, a constant and reassuring presence at the centre of our national life. For decade after decade, she represented a changing kingdom to itself and to the world. Above all, hers was a life guided by a Christian faith and driven by a profound sense of duty and by the pledge she made to the world on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to the 
Occupation Kill Service entered the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow. And God bless all of you for all we need to share with you.